August 8th, 1882, Blackberry, Kentucky. Three of Randall McCoy's sons are at the Election Day events in Blackberry, Kentucky. Tolbert, Farmer, and Randall Jr., also known as Bud, also at the Election Day events was Elias Hatfield, who is the son of Anderson Hatfield, known as Preacher Ants, who is Devil Ants Hatfield's cousin. Also in attendance was Devil Ants Hatfield's brother, Ellison, who was 41 years old. So the story is that Elias Hatfield, known as Bad Elias, got into an argument with the three McCoy boys, or at least one of them. Somehow during this argument, Ellison Hatfield became involved. When this happened, the three McCoy boys attacked Ellison, stabbing him 26 times and then shooting him. Ellison was then whisked back to Warm Holler outside of Maitland, West Virginia. As they were taking the McCoy boys to Pike County to be held until they could bring them to court, the Hatfields intervened and took the three McCoy boys and held them in West Virginia until they could see what would happen to Ellison. When Ellison Hatfield died, the three McCoy boys were brought into Kentucky. You boys understand what's going on here? Not very far from the, where the election day event occurred. They were tied to pawpaw trees and they were shot. They were shot over 50 times and died. So why is this important? Well, because our story today isn't necessarily about this. It's about the events that occurred after this. One of the boys that died, Tolbert, was no boy. He was a man and he had three children with his wife, Mary Butcher. So when he died, I'll show you the census here. You can see 1880, who all lived at Randall McCoy's house. Tolbert wasn't there. So in 1882, when this event occurred, somehow between that and 1888, Tolbert's son, Melvin McCoy, who was very little at the time, and his little sister, Cora, went to live with their grandparents. I'm not really sure what happened to Mary, or was Mary there as well, I don't know. I can't find a census after 1880 for Randall McCoy to see who was all in the house later. But what I do know is that Melvin McCoy and little Cora McCoy was there the night that the Hatfields gathered up a posse and rode to the McCoy's house New Year's night and attacked and burned down the McCoy cabin. So we've heard this story. Anyone involved with the Hatfield McCoys have heard this story. And yeah, it sounds horrible, but no, 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 no. It was really horrible. And I came across this testimony at Johnson, Johnsy Hatfield's court hearing where Melvin testified of what he says happened that night. And it gives a much clearer picture of the real horrors that went on that night. Now, you know our channel, and we are neutral. We do not lean towards Hatfields, and we do not lean towards McCoys. We're just here to tell things as we run across it. Uh, we live right here in the area. Leo grew up here and was born and raised. His family has been here from conception of the area, basically. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and play the court testimony. I've set it up in, uh, you know, a way that it's computer voices because it's the only way to really do it um, correctly, I feel like, without, you know, I don't have actors I can pay, play to do this. And it doesn't sound right just rattling it off. And then Leo is going to take you to some of the locations, like the place where they hid out that night, uh, the place that little Cora and Melvin are supposed to be buried, and a couple surprises along the way. So I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you learn uh, a little bit about, you know, the, what happened that night, and really, really try to just put yourself in their shoes, if just for a minute. How old are you? 17 years is about my age. What kin are you to Randolph McCoy? He is my grandfather. Were you at his house at the time Ollie Fair McCoy was killed? Yes, sir. 
Now Melvin, do you know how old you were at the time? Six was about my age. Now tell the jury if you remember what occurred, tell what occurred in your own way. On New Year's 1888, I object on the grounds that he was of such a tender age at the time of the killing that he is incompetent. Overruled. On New Year's 1888, or about that time, the Hatfields come to my grandfather's house and surrounded the house. The first words I remember was they said, God damn you we have got you. We are going to take you to Logan County. You shan't be hurt. Then they fired into the house and shot a right smart through the house. Then you know one of my aunts Oliver came and told them not to burn the house down and they shot her down. Then from that time you know the house was burned and we all left the house. Now Melvin, which room were you in? With my grandfather. Who else was in the room with you? One of my uncles, Calvin. Who was in the other room? One of my aunts that was killed and another one of my aunts. Who else? My grandma. Which room was the fire set to? The one my grandfather was in. Do you know who went out of the house first? My uncle and grandmother, grandmother first. Who went next? My uncle Calvin went next. They told me to come in the house where grandma was. I turned and went and got my clothes and went back in the room where they were. What did you discover? I saw a man. Did you know any of the parties? No, sir, I did not. Did you see your aunt? Yes, sir. Where was she? Laying there dead in the door. Or near the door. What was her name? Allie Fair McCoy. Did you examine her? No, sir, I did not. At the time you found her laying in the door, was the house on fire? Yes, sir. Where did Calvin go, and did you see him anymore? Not until the next morning and we found him dead. Did you see your grandmother anymore that night? Yes, sir. I stayed with her all the time. Was there anything that was the matter with your grandmother? Yes, sir. She had been struck with something on the head. Johnson Hatfield struck her with a Winchester. Did the house burn down? Yes, sir. Where did you go? Up the branch from the house. Who went with you? My two aunts and myself dragged my dead aunt up there. How far from the burning building did you get? Two or three hundred yards. Did you have any fire? No, sir. What kind of night was it? It was freezing cold. Was the ground frozen up? Yes, sir. Where did you stay the rest of the night? Up the branch until daylight. How many was up there? My grandma, two aunts, little sister and myself and my dead aunt. How far was Calvin away from you all? I do not know how far it was, three or four hundred yards I guess. Did you lay Calvin on anything? No sir, we did not know he was killed until the next morning. Was your aunt that got killed dressed or in her night clothes? She had her clothes on. How was your grandmother dressed? I do not remember. Was your sister Cora dressed? I think she had her clothes on. Did you examine your dead aunt to see if she had any wounds? She was shot through the left breast. How long had you been acquainted with her? She raised me. My children dead. My wife hurt and my house burned. Whatever we want now. Rules are done. Today, I'm in Pike County, Kentucky, just outside of Hardy. Uh, it's right down the road right there. This, for those of you who don't know, some of you I'm sure do, for the rest of you, this is the site of Randall McCoy's house. This is the site of the New Year's Eve massacre. That is Randall McCoy's backyard in the center of your screen right there. And there's a statue of Randall, of course. Um, like I said, this is uh, 
uh, the site of Randall and Sarah McCoy's cabin, which was burned in the early hours of New Year's Day in, 19, in 1888. Uh, as Since we've already told you the details about what happened on that cold night, um, I'm basically just going to point out some of the things about the testimony and show you the site, of course. Um, so just think about, for a second, the headspace of little Melvin. He had lost his dad and two of his uncles gunned down at the pawpaw tree site. Now he had witnessed his aunt, who was his caregiver, and his uncle Calvin murdered, as well as his grandmother beaten and his family home burned. He spent the night with the others and his dead aunt Alifair's body about two to three hundred yards up the branch from his cabin. According to him, the ground was icy and it's been told in other accounts that the blood had frozen some of the dead ma family members to the ground. They had no fire. Some of the family members barely had clothes on. And none of them were even remotely dressed for those kind of temperatures. Cora would be terribly frostbitten on her legs and feet that night. And she suffered a fall that led to her untimely death that same year. She was also being raised now by the McCoy family after Tolbert's death. Cora was five or six according to census at this time. Her mother was Mary Ann Butcher, the same as Melvin's mother. Uh, she was rumored to have been a hunchback child. Now we have uh, some information. This is the report of the Adjutant General of Kentucky in Frankfort, Kentucky on February 6th, 1888. Now I'm just kind of, you know, going to work my way through here. I want to point out some stuff and then I want to show you something up through there here just in a second. Now, uh, two of the chil two children of Tolbert McCoy, a boy about seven years old and a little hunchback girl about five where they remained until the neighbors arrived until about daylight. The heroic girl had her feet badly frostbitten from which she has not yet recovered and she could not avoid weeping freely as the old lady detailed to me in her presence the horrors of that terrible night. The little boy too is worthy of special mention. For when he emerged from the burning dwelling, when it was almost ready to fall, he thought of his little crippled sister, who was still in the house. He re-entered and again came forth, leading her by the hand. Nor did he even cry during the whole of the battle. This is, of course, information I can't set in stone, like a lot of these things that relate to the feud. But it does point pretty heavily to the fact that Cora was lost as well. She never shows up again anywhere in any records. The truth is, Randall lost three children this night, not two, as the stories say. One of them just died a little bit later, that's all. Randall McCoy and his family then moved to Pikeville, Kentucky, where Cora eventually, where Cora passed away and is buried in an unmarked grave or should I say more of a, a lost grave, along with Melvin. Melvin shows on census as growing to an old man in his 60s with a family and dying in Pikeville, Kentucky as well. Unfortunately, the records, marker stones, wooden crosses, and so on have all been lost to time. But we still wanted to take time to tell you this story. So now you can decide for yourself. What do you think? Were there two children killed that night? Or were there three? Now, we are going to head up here in a minute. And I'm going to head up here. I got on Google Earth on satellite image. And I did a little bit of a, did my homework last night. And I think I have the spot picked out. I think I know where they hid. I'm going to head back here in just in a second, and I've got this mapped out on GPS, 
and I'm going to head back to the spot where they hid for the night. Okay, now, this spot right here that you are looking at, I used the gas well right there as a landmark on uh, my satellite image when I was doing my research last night. I used that as my landmark. That well right there is exactly 250 yards from the cabin. Now, according to Melvin's testimony in court, they hid out up here two to three hundred yards up from the cabin. Folks, we are within 50 yards of the exact spot where they hid out that night. Now you imagine that, right? It's New Year's Eve, you know, January 1st by a few hours. It's freezing cold. You've just watched a lot of your family get murdered. And you're up here hiding with your dead aunt and a few other relatives injured, freezing. And you're out here. And now you got to picture this in the winter time. It's not going to be all pretty and green. It's going to be desolate. And I did notice one thing as I got up here. When I first got here, I noticed this. This exact spot is exactly, okay, this spot is exactly 250 yards. He said that they went two to 300 yards. If you look directly in front of where I'm standing, and I stopped here for a reason. If you look directly in front of where I'm standing, do you not see a really good hiding spot? Get down in there and hide. I mean, can you just imagine your family bleeding out and literally frozen to the ground? You know, passed away, deceased, and their blood is frozen to the ground. You know, a lot of people, they've taken this feud <clears throat> and they've romanticized it. You know, the courage of this one, the bravery of that one, that sort of thing. When you get right down to it, there was nothing courageous or brave about it. You know, it was a family feud. And, you know, I'm related to both. So, you know, they were... They were just trying to kill each other, plain and simple. You know, they just wanted each other dead. And they were willing to go take action to do it. All you can do is sit there and pray for daylight. Pray for the sun to come out. That's the only thing you can do. Now, we've brought a lot of Hatfield-McCoy stories to the forefront you know we've done a lot of stories about Hatfield the Hatfield and McCoy feud but you know this one kind of rings home just a little bit you know I mean it's it's a massacre you know this is children they weren't children weren't involved in the feud you know the kids weren't involved in the feud but they got dragged into it you know children children have no place in a feud but these got dragged into it anyway. Anyway, guys, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring y'all up here and actually show you this place and kind of drive home the point, you know, of what this must have actually been like for these people hiding up here in the woods, knowing that Hatfields are right down here a couple hundred yards just itching to kill them. Imagine that. And like I said, just imagine this place in the winter. You know, snow, cold, freezing cold. And you're not even really dressed for it. You're dressed for bed. 
whole thing was a terrible story. But I, I'll leave the camera on, and I'm going to start walking back down a little bit. I want to show y'all something about how far this is. And, you know, you're, you're dragging injured and dead family members up here as you go. And this is a couple gas wells. There's a gas well up here now. And I noticed the pipe as I was coming up. There's a drain pipe right there. So I kind of went up and just went past it a little bit to try and get to where it was natural ground, not, you know, not something that's been changed, you know, to kind of give you an idea of what the place actually looked like. But other than this pipe and that gas well pipe right there, I'm guessing this has not changed. What you're looking at is more or less what they would have been looking at. Just a lot less green. Imagine that. And you can see all kinds of deer. There's all kinds of wildlife here. I'm sure this was a great place to, you know, to hunt and to live. You know, I'm sure that the entire family was very, very familiar with the land back here. And probably when they took up the hill, they probably had a really good idea of where they wanted to go hide. I'm trying to be careful. I'm getting covered. Spiders and spider webs, those little yellow golden orb weavers. I've been picking them off me constantly as I'm going up and back down. But just imagine such a beautiful place and something so tragic to happen here. You know, it just kind of, as beautiful as the place is, knowing its history, you know, knowing its prominence, to me, in a way, I know it doesn't really but to me, in a way, it kind of diminishes the place's beauty just a little bit. It's not quite as pretty, you know, because you know what happened here. There's just something, there's something tainted about it, if that makes any sense. Now this right here, big poke plants like that. I'm sure they ate a lot of that too. Now this right here is the end of Randall McCoy's backyard. That's literally, you're looking at Randall McCoy's yard right there. That's his backyard. And this is the branch. Look at that moth. I'm pretty. Come here little dude. So pretty. <laughs> okay, you go take off. But this, like I said, this is the back of Randall McCoy's yard. So realistically speaking, I have zero doubt that everyone in the family knew this spot, this area, including the hiding spot, very well. You see, if you go down this clearing, I don't know how well you can see, right? Let me see if I can get this right. Right there at the end of the field, that bush. I don't know if you can see there's a shed roof. That's where Randall's house was at, was right there. So they really, they really didn't go that far. You know, the hiding spot that they chose was right back there. I imagine that spot held an awful place in their memory everyone who lived through it you know a horrible tragic night I'm sure that spot 
gave them nightmares for years to come. This is actually the first time I've been up this far. I've been, you know, to the old home place many, many times, you know, bringing trail riders and just doing our videos and so on. But this is the first time that I've actually came back here and looked for this site. We just found this information not long ago doing a little bit of research. We just happened to run across this and the testimony that described the spot. So we thought we would show you guys that. Take you out and show you something that most likely has never been seen before, ever. Uh, it's like the movie, the Hatfield McCoy movie with Kevin Costner. They called it a docudrama. You know, it's based on true facts. You know, there, there were, uh, there was a family named Hatfields and a family named McCoys. And you know, the right after that is where the truth starts to get buried right after that point so we thought it was important to bring you guys up here you know and pull out this page from the history books and shine a little light on it i mean things like this things like this should be remembered they should be documented the story should be told but it should be a cautionary tale, if you know what I mean. It should be a cautionary tale. Don't do this. Don't follow this path. A lot of people these days though, that's the path they choose, isn't it? Now, if I'm not mistaken, the house set right here on this spot right here. And that's Randall McCoy's old well right there. That's the only thing that's left from the old home place is Randall's well. Randall McCoy's well. I can see me in the bottom of it. Good lesson, in it? There are stories like this you should so try to see yourself in it. And not do that. Learn something. Okay, now this is, yes, I know it's raining. I'm in the rain again. Now this, as you can see, is Chirico's restaurant. Now, what is Leo doing at Chirico's? Is he hungry? No. He's, well, he is. Yes, actually, now that you mention it. That's not why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> this was actually Randall McCoy's house when he moved to Pikeville. Uh, see, after all of this stuff, you know, happened over back where we were at Randall's old house, he moves to Pikeville. Now, I don't know if Melvin and Cora lived right here in this house with Randall. It says that they moved to Pikeville. So, they were either here at Randall's house with him or very close. One or the other. So, if they weren't here, they were really close to this place. Oh, I just wanted to stop by here really quick, you know, just for a second. To show you Randall's old house. And there's a really good chance... That Melvin and Cora were brought here. Don't know that for sure. Can't say for certain. But there's a really good chance. So as I was doing this video, I actually came across a 1910 census of Randall McCoy. He's 86 years old. It's in 1910, like I said. It's in Pike County, Kentucky. Pikeville. Um, it has... Melvin actually listed as the head of the house and it has Randall listed as the grandfather definitely Melvin McCoy that we're talking about he's 31 he's married to Anna and their son Solomon is there as well so I thought that was pretty interesting 
Rendell died of burns that he received in a cook stove and senility. So, you know, Melvin was the one taking care of him before his death. And I thought that should have been noted, so that's why I'm putting it on here. Okay, now this, as you guys can see, is the Old Pike County Courthouse and Jail. Now, courthouse erected 88-89 by McDonald Brothers, later renovated 1932-33. to Here was the scene of the Hatfield clan trials for the murders of Tolbert, Randolph Jr., Farmer, Alifair, and Calvin McCoy. The defendants lodged in an adjacent jail, found guilty, and sentenced to life in prison, except for Ellison Mounts, hanged on February 18th of 1890. The courthouse and jail, part of the Hatfield-McCoy Feud Historic District. Now this is the courthouse right here. Now this complex wasn't quite as elaborate, obviously, as it was, or now as it is back then. It's a little bit more elaborate now. But this is the actual site. Uh, you know, we're here for we're here for Cor and Melvin. You know, that's that's who we're here for today. The children who had no part in this feud. You know, they 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 were children, you know, they had had nothing in it. They had no hatred in their hearts for for Hatfields and they wound up getting drawn into the feud anyway i just wanted to we just wanted to uh you know kind of touch on this story and melvin and cora's story you know a lot of the the hatfields and mccoy's devil ants and randall mccoy and cap and jauncey you know they all have their places in the history book secured but you know the children are a different story Now this right here, as you can see, is the McCoy family grave site. I am just, I'm still in Pikeville, not far from where I was. Uh, this is the Dill Cemetery here, where Randall McCoy and his wife are buried, and Roseanne right next to them. Melvin and Cora are up here somewhere. Now, from what our understanding from what we've gathered is that they were they were more or less there's no cement marker so to speak there were wooden crosses that kind of thing and they well they aren't here you know a hundred years later you know it's just wood it tends to tends to decompose but this is Dill's Cemetery. Randall and his wife are right here. Colonel Dill's is up here on the hill. And uh, I brought y'all over here once before, Heather and I did. Of course, we didn't have a very good camera at the time. And right there is the one and only Randall McCoy. Right here, I'll get close up to these in a second. This is Roseanne, y'all may have heard about her. And right here is Randall's grave. Let me get around here. Now, right there is Sarah, and right here is Randall. And if you look, I want to show y'all something. If you look right here, you can see Randall's original stone. Okay? Now, look over here. This is Sarah's original stone. Now contrast that with the marble statue at Devalance's grave. 
You get where I'm going here? You see Devil Lance, he was very wealthy. Randall was... Eh, right there is their original markers. Randall McCoy's original headstone right there. It's amazing, isn't it? And then the new grave, the new stone here. And of course, Rosanna. I just wanted to show you guys this real quick. It's a death certificate I came across. Catherine Violet McCoy, September 12th, 1911 premature birth and something else it was she was 12 days old but it's melvin mccoy and his wife georgia ann which is annie they called her mccoy and she is buried at dills and it says undertaker melvin mccoy which is interesting but i just wanted to show you guys that so i, I believe they are all up at dills